Amen. You may be seated today. It's an exciting day for a, a lot of reasons. Uh, we are coming on the end of our series today, Real Family Matters, the, uh, the longest series we've had at Vertical. We had some long ones. We did Pray Bold. That lasted a pretty good while and got, saw God do amazing things through that. But in this series, Real Family Matters, um, we only had intended to have it for two months, but God has taken us five months through this process and real change is happening in individuals, in families, and we're seeing change happen. So uh, it's one of those mixed things that come to the end of a series today, a little bit of sadness, but a, a lot of excitement for what God has done and a lot of excitement for what's ahead. Um, there's more coming that God has for us, and we want to be attentive to all of that. I've told you before that my background in college was architecture and design. That's what I was headed toward before, I was, before God called me into ministry. But he still allows me opportunities from time to time to be able to use some of those skills and interest. And, you know, if you were to look at my social media, you would find that I follow a lot of uh, architecture and design folks. I love seeing uh, old houses made new. I love seeing new paint colors, new designs, walls taken out, walls put up completely change the look of a space. All that stuff is fascinating to me. I believe it's, a, it's, a, it's an interest and a passion God has put into my heart. And so when I see this whole idea of a house and the fact that God makes things new and I watch shows on TV where they are remodeling a house or something, I see, wow, look at that. They've completely transformed a house that was broken down and was old and outdated I quickly remember this is exactly what God is doing in us. He is taking the old house of who I was that had a floor and foundation that was built on guilt. He's taken the house of me that had walls of pride and stubbornness. He's taken the old house of me that had rooms that were filled with self-pity and self-punishment. He's taken the old house of me that had closets in it that I didn't let anybody into and were filled with addictions. He's taken all of those and he remodels all of it, amen? And to the degree that we'll let him into all the rooms of the house, he will make them over. He'll make all things new and he'll make us new in the process. And he will completely transform us. And this church is full of people who are just that. And the fact that the Bible says that this is who we are. Now, we are the house of the Holy Spirit, wow, we're made over temples walking around. Amen? We're made over houses. You are. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, a follower of Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God has come to dwell in you, and he's in the process of making you over. Amen? I don't know how many rooms you let him into, but if you let him into some more, he'll make over some more, right? And not only will he do that in you, he'll start a process of expanding that outside of you into your family. He'll start making over the house you live in and he'll turn what had been toxic, what had been broken down, and he will make it new. He'll restore what's been broken. He'll make new what's been old and he will heal even in families. He will make families real where they're not pretentious where they're not put on, where they're not broken down. He will make them new and real, and real matters. In this day and time especially, real matters. You know, uh, Trude and I have a lot of conversations about generational differences and, you know, the way my generation sees life versus the way his generation versus the way even students coming up see life. And one of the things that the younger generation today has a real aversion to is anything that looks fake or pretentious. Now, I think we all do to some degree, but there's, a, there's an even greater distaste for that in younger people. If they see something that looks pretentious, put on, plastic, fake, they're not interested in that. They want the genuine and the real. And I think in some ways, we all do. This is what Jesus is interested in doing in our families, making us people who are genuine, authentic, who truly love the Lord, who are able to genuinely talk about our walk with him, where he has changed us and where he is changing us. 
to change the home environment where there's genuine conversation about Jesus. Not religious, condescending, rule-based discussions about Jesus, but authentic, genuine conversations about here's what Jesus has done for me. What is he doing in you? Let's talk about the Bible. Let's talk about what it says about us and who we are and who he is and how to follow Jesus with our lives. This is what God is doing. This is what he is intent on doing in making real families because real families matter. They are a powerful picture of the gospel in this world today. And one of the things that we've been seeing lately is here in our church is the power of God to take a family where the conversation in the home has been filled with complaint and resentment and conflict and silence and to turn all of that around and make the home a place where you talk in ways that honor God. Where Jesus is glorified in the conversation. Where you don't talk about how terrible life is, how terrible everything else is out in the world, how, how hard it is to follow Jesus. I mean, that sounds like a beating, all of that right there. But instead, we talk about the goodness of God. We talk about the power of God. We talk about how much God has blessed us. We bless one another in our homes. We, we do a lot more blessing of one another than we do complaining about one another. Amen? There's a time to correct. There's a time to confront. There's a time to have honest conversations. But all of that is to be in the context of speaking blessing to one another. Blessing that says, I love you. I am grateful to God that he gave me you. You are such an important part of God's hand in my life. I see Jesus in you. I see Jesus working through you. God has incredible things planned for your life. God is at work in our family. Those are spoken blessings that we ought to be just good at. Just speaking in the rhythm of blessing in your home. Noticing where God is answering prayer. Noticing where he is at work. Helping another person in your family see where God is at work. Thanking them for how he is using them. Those are words of blessing. As we've said, in this generation, Christianity sometimes gets it backwards and thinks about blessings in terms of um, you know, cars, trucks, houses, money, bank accounts, and jobs, all that stuff. That's cool. Those can be ways that God shows his hand to us. But in the Bible, if you look at the word blessing, it's always spoken words. And so in our homes, we've been learning the rhythm of blessing, speaking blessing to one another. But today, as we close our series out, this is perhaps one of the most important things that God has for us, is to, in our homes, learn what it means to not just bless one another, but to bless God in our home. Today, our message is called The Power of Blessing God in Your House. This is where the real power happens. This is where the real change happens. This is where you get the full makeover and people walk into your house and say, wow, look what you've done to the place. This is incredible. Love the lighting, love the mood, love the vibe, all that stuff. But there's something different in here. It's like there's peace in your home all of a sudden. And it's not because you've picked a cool blue or a nice gray in your couch, but it's because the spirit of God's presence in your house all of a sudden. Amen? It's because all of a sudden you have turned the language of your home into the language of heaven and you have started blessing God in your home. And the Bible has a lot to say about this. Today we're going to look at one chapter. I'm going to look at some verses from the chapter, actually. Psalm 103 is where we're going to hang out today for just a little bit. Psalm 103, almost in the middle of your Bible. The writings here of David. Many believe that David is writing from a, an older place in his life, you know, my age and older. And they're looking back on life, and they are, and he is recognizing, wow, I've seen God do so much. He's brought me through some very dark days. See, David had known some defeat. David had known some victory. David had known mercy from God he didn't deserve. 
David had known some dark days of wondering if God was even going to show up. And here he is in Psalm 103, and he's going to write about what it means to look back on life, have the right perspective, and with his words, truly bless God. Because when you will out loud with your mouth begin to bless God, you will see a change happen in you. And you will see a change happen in your home. You will actually see the atmosphere in your house change. Today we're going to look at three things, uh, three verses from this chapter. The first thing we see is in verse 1. David writes and he says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Now, David's going to spend the next 20 verses talking about what that is. He's going to talk about all the ways that God has blessed him, all the ways that God has been faithful. And what's interesting to me, I love this here. Look what it says. It says, bless the Lord, O my soul. Here is David talking to his soul. Here is David from his spirit. We're going to separate these two here. Spirit, the core of who you are, talking to his soul which we believe is your mind, your will, and your emotions. Have you ever needed to tell your mind to calm down? Have you ever needed to tell your emotions emotions to get in check? Have you ever needed to tell your will, you need to hold up, buddy? Yeah? This is what David's doing here. And he's saying, when I look back at my life, I know the importance of saying to my mind and my will and my emotions, Oh, you need to bless the Lord, oh my soul. You need to get in line. You need to do what God is calling us to do because who I am in my spirit is who I really am. Sometimes my mind goes off wandering and I gotta bring it back. I gotta renew my mind, the New Testament says. And sometimes my emotions, they'll go for entire day trips, longer road trips, I even lose them sometimes. I don't even know where they are anymore sometimes. Hello? And sometimes they'll come back and they think they own the place. You ever had your emotions take over? And all of a sudden you can't even think straight because your emotions think they're in charge. You can't even worship because your emotions are so much in charge. You can't even choose to do the right thing because emotions think they're in charge. And here's David saying, hold up. Oh, my soul. This is our moment to bless the Lord. We are going to speak his worth and his value. This is what we do as Jesus followers. We tell our mind to get in line. We tell our emotions to get in check. We tell our will to do what God says. This is where the world has kind of lost their mind today. The message of the world today is that there is no God, and so whatever you feel is the most important thing. Whatever you feel is like deity. Therefore, bow to it. Yield to it. Whatever urge you got, give in to it. But here's the deal. This is not who we are as Jesus followers. We've been given the Spirit of God to live in this new house. And he owns the house. And so any urge that comes up, we don't let it have its way. We let the Spirit of God rule over every urge. Who in the room besides me sometimes has an urge that's not in line with God's ways? Hello, that's all of us, right? You're going to have the temptation. You're going to have the urge. Just because you have it doesn't mean that's who you are. It just means it's what you're urging in the moment. And sometimes you got to tell the urge you're not in control. The Spirit of God is in control in this house now. And so you have to say to yourself, soul, we're going to bless the Lord. All that's within me is going to bless his holy name. Every part of me. So you speak to yourself. And our first big point here, you speak power to the soul of your house as well. The house of you and the house you live in. Did you know that your house has a Soul. Now, I don't mean it's alive. I don't mean it's a breathing thing. Maybe use a different word here. Your house has a a vibe to it, doesn't it? Now, let me catch you up on what I've been caught up with 
about what even the younger generation calls what we call vibe. All right? We used to say, in the 70s, we said mood, right? Then there became, uh, then there was vibe that came along. Here's what the younger people call it today. They call it your aura. Everybody's got an aura, right? Now, for us older folks, that sounds real hippie-like from the 60s, doesn't it? Yeah? It goes, takes us all the way back there. You ain't, you ain't new. We know this word, aura, right? It wasn't always good back in our day, though. But for them, aura is who, your vibe, you know? It's kind of your, your feel, your groove. You got another word, groove, you know? Your house has an aura to it, and it's determined by what is said in your house. If all the time you are speaking with words of complaining and anger and selfishness and how unhappy you are and how everyone makes you mad, you are giving off a bad aura. Come on. You're giving off a bad vibe. You got a, you got a upside down groove going on in that house. And everybody knows it. They come in and they're what is going on in this house here? You know what I'm talking about. If you want to change the vibe in your house, you got to start blessing God out loud in your house. You start talking about how good God is in your house. You start talking about how he's answered prayer in your house. You start talking about how he's worked in your life in your house. You start putting on some worship music and talk about how you love this song because it helps you worship God in this way. You will change the mood, vibe, groove, and aura of your house. You'll speak power to the soul of your house, and you ought to. If you want to see God in your house, he's given you the privilege of setting the thermostat. You get to choose, and you will choose it by your words. By the ones you speak, by the ones you don't speak, you can inject a spirit of hope and love and peace in your house if you will speak out loud and bless God in your house. This is what's so sad about a generation of Christians who have chosen to keep their faith private. There's some Christians who say, oh, well, it's just uh, it's way too private. I just can't talk about it out loud because, you know, I might get all emotional. Okay, and that's a bad thing? You want to change the mood, vibe, aura in your house? Say out loud what God is doing in you. Say it. Bless God and you will change your home. The power of God will come alive in your home. David goes on in verse 20, after he's talked about all the ways that God has blessed him. Verse 20 says, bless the Lord, you his angels who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. David turns from saying, bless the Lord, O my soul, to saying, bless the Lord, you his angels. Because David recognized there were some other beings in the house. There's some other beings in this house right now. There are angels present right now in this room. They are ministering spirits of God, doing his will and his purposes. And if you were a Jesus follower, they're in your house as well. They are doing the work that God has given them to do. And when you bless God, you give them the position and the power to go to work in your house. I'll take that. Amen? I want some angels at work in my house. I want them doing what he has called them to do. They are in subjection to him to do exactly what he has said, to do his word. And when you and I do his word, they say, look, they're doing what we're doing. Let's get in on that. But if you are not blessing God in your house, they just step back and say, come on, man, would you please just start blessing God? We can't do anything until you do. You see, the deal is, 
if instead in your house you are speaking words of curse, I don't mean profanity, but words of curse like God doesn't hear us. God's not going to do anything. God's not present. God's not going to work in this situation. God can't hear us. You are speaking cursing on your house, and you're keeping the angels from being able to work, and you instead are opening up your door to another force in the realm, the demonic. Jesus told a story that is both fascinating and frightening. Now, jot this down, Matthew 12, verse 43 through 45. Jesus is talking about a, a man who had an unclean spirit in him. It doesn't tell us what the spirit was, just that it was an unclean spirit. So it could have been greed, lust, narcissism, bitterness, selfishness, legalism, pessimistic, heavy-handed, guilting, shaming, anxiety, jealousy. We don't know what it was. But this story that Jesus tells, it talks about a man who has this spirit cast out of him. Here's what it says. I'll read it to you. I don't have this on screen. I'm just going to read it to you. He says, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man... He goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. This is some, we're getting a behind the scenes look at the the demonic realm. And Jesus says, when when an evil spirit is cast out of someone, they leave and they go looking for someone else to take up residence in. And Jesus said, they go through dry places seeking rest. Evil spirits are looking for a place to land. They're looking for someone that they can take up residence in. And they're looking for some dry places. Some places where some people have gotten dry, where they've given up where they've turned away, where they've rejected, and there's no fresh oil, there's no fresh water, there's no fresh walk. They're led to dry places, and they've turned away. And here's what the demonic voice says, and Jesus tells us that the Spirit says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Whoo! It's frightening. It's alarming. Concerning. Because Jesus said, when a man chooses to follow Christ, an evil spirit will leave. And here's what happens sometimes. A man will clean up his house and say, there, I'm all cleaned up. It's all nice in order now. But having a house that's nice and clean and in order is not what you need. You need a house that's filled with the Spirit of God. You don't need an empty house. You need a filled house. Sometimes people will try to empty their lives from some evil and things they've been a part of And forget to fill them back up with the things that God says to be a part of. They'll try to clean up their language, but they won't turn their language into starting being one that blesses God. And what will happen instead is they'll wonder what happened because all of a sudden, life will all of a sudden turn worse. Because that same spirit will come back on them and say, hey friends, I found a place that's clean and empty. Come on in. And he brings seven more with him worse than he was Look, in this whole series right here, Real Family Matters, if you've come to the place where you recognize some toxic, dysfunctional, narcissistic behaviors, that's awesome, that's great. Repent of those, clean your house, but don't just think because you left it that it's gonna stay gone forever because unless you fill that space now with words and language and activities and pursuits that glorify God and bless God, they will come back and they'll bring their friends and you will not like their friends. Real family 
matters. Not a clean, neat house matters. Real. Speaking and blessing God. When you speak and bless God in your house, you speak power to angelic forces. That's our second big point this morning. You actually speak power to the angelic forces. You give them room. You give them authority. You give them power. So don't go back to old patterns. Speak and bless God in your house. If you go back to the old ways and you let dryness take over and you let complaining take over, start speaking defeat, start agreeing with the enemy and agreeing with anxiety and yielding to fear and giving in to rejection, all that stuff, what you're doing is putting the welcome mat back out that says, hey, all unclean spirits, welcome here. Not in my house, amen? Not in my house. But if you will practice, actively practice speaking and blessing God in your house, you will send the demons packing and you'll send the angels right into activity in your house. Verse 22 of Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord all his works in all places of his dominion. Heather, would you get my Bible out of my backpack? I'm about to need it. I'm going to read a passage. David says here, bless the Lord, O my soul. Then he says, bless the Lord, you his angels. And now he's going to say, bless the Lord, all his works. Thank you. He says, now I want to make sure in my house and in my place that everybody understands that the works of God are honored in this place. Amen? I want to talk about the works of God. I want to talk about the things that he is doing. And so here's the deal. When something good happens in your house, make sure you speak and bless God because of that. Amen? Don't be silent on the matter. And don't say, well, that was good luck. Don't bless luck. There ain't even no such thing as luck. And don't say, well, look what I did. Come on, don't bless yourself in this deal. And don't say, that's karma for you. Come on, there's no such thing as karma either. Don't bless karma. And don't give credit to, well, that's just the way things go. No, don't bless whatever that is. Bless God when something good happens in your life. If, if something good happens, acknowledge God did this. Well, I found a good deal on Facebook Marketplace. No, you didn't. God showed it to you. He said, well, I got a check in the mail from an insurance company. No, God sent that to you recognize that. Well, my husband was nice to me today. No, God did that. He blessed you through that husband. It was a miracle, wasn't it? (laughs) If good happens, bless God for it. Bless the Lord all his works. If it happens, acknowledge it's from God. Say, well, what if it doesn't happen? What if good doesn't happen? What if evil happens? What if something sad happens? Then you bless God when it happens. You bless God that even when it's happening, he's still faithful. You bless God that he hears you when you pray. You bless God that he will never leave you or forsake you. You bless God that he's working all things together for good. You bless God that he is growing your faith even in the trial. You bless God that he is, even, he is good even when you don't understand it always. Amen? You bless God in that moment. Bless the Lord all his works. And if you're a follower of Jesus, he is in control of your life. He is allowing what is happening in your life. You might not understand it. You might not call it good but he has already defined it as part of his plan. Bless God in it, amen? Because when you do, you speak power to God's work in your house. You wanna change the atmosphere? You start seeing God at work in your house. You start acknowledging it, start saying it. You'll find all of a sudden, people in your house have hope you'll all of a sudden start seeing that people have strength and faith in the midst of a struggle. 
You'll see that your house will have a new sense of confidence and faith in it. You'll see that your house will have a whole new spirit of peace because you have begun to bless God in your house. Now, I want to read a passage from 2 Chronicles chapter 5 because the story here is about a house that God told the people to build. It's the temple. It's the physical temple in the Old Testament, and Solomon is building it. It's why the New Testament says that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit today. It's a picture from this Old Testament temple. And the temple was the place where sacrifices were made. And it was the place that the glory of God dwelt. And so Solomon builds it. And for several chapters leading up to this, he's describing what he's doing. And he's building it according to a pattern that God had given to Moses for the tabernacle. And it is ornate. It's beautiful. It's the ultimate makeover. House temple edition. And they get near the end of this, of completing it. And it says that they bring in the Ark of the Covenant. The place where the blood would be poured out. The place where where sin was atoned for, the place where the glory of God dwelt. And as they're completing it, they finish that one piece. In verse 11, it says, And it came to pass when the priests came out of the most holy place, for all the priests who were present had sanctified themselves without keeping to their divisions. And the Levites, who were the singers... All those of Asaph and Heman and Jeduthun, with their sons and their brethren, stood at the east end of the altar, clothed in white linen, having cymbals and stringed instruments and harps, and with them 120 priests sounding with trumpets. Indeed, it came to pass when the trumpeters and the singers were as one to make one sound, to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of singing and praised the Lord, saying, here is what they said in their songs, for he is good, his mercy endures forever. They were blessing God in that moment out loud. It's the story of the temple. It's the story of this temple, your temple. It's the story of your house. Whenever you will choose to bless God out loud in your house, here's what happens. It says, when they began to do this, that the house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. Here in this moment, because they gathered in unity, because they gathered to say it out loud, because they gathered to bless God, the glory of the God, The glory of God showed up in that moment. And the glory of God changed that space in that moment. And everyone was aware that the glory of God filled that space. I think, man, I want that for me. I want there to be such a clear awareness that I know and believe that he is good and his mercy endures forever, that I say it. I don't just keep it in. I don't just think it. I say it. And the more I say it in my marriage, the more the glory of God shows up in my marriage. The more I say it in my house, whether I've got my kids, grandkids, Heather's parents, family, whoever, friends, church members, whoever, When I say it in my house, it changes the atmosphere of my house. 
It brings the glory of God into my house. It's what happens here on a Sunday morning. It's what God wants to have happen in our houses every morning, every day, every evening. If you'll bless God out loud in your house, he'll change your house. He'll change the vibe. He'll change the groove. He'll change the aura because he will be there. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, I know that's your desire is to show your glory here in us as your temples and in our homes. So God, I ask you to open our mouths that we might speak and sing of your glory, that we would not withhold, we would not keep in, we would not be shy, embarrassed, awkward, but that we would, with great courage and great faith, speak of your goodness and proclaim as one that you are good and your mercy endures forever. So, Father, I thank you. I pray this will be true here for us, even in this moment, as we open our mouths to sing out of the oneness, out of the goodness that your glory would be seen and known here. Thank you for being so good to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you